Hello, and welcome to the ELECT's webinar, Introduction to R for Libraries. I'm Lisa Lorenzo, a member of the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Clark Iacovacus. Clark is the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. He has worked in both academic and public libraries since 2007 as a PAGE, Library Assistant, and Research and Instruction Librarian. He has presented at ACRL and ALA on topics pertaining to usability and incorporating data into assessment. He is currently achieving his master's degree in history, and he does not come from a, from a computing or technical background. He brings much expertise to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have him with us today. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is ALCTSCE. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for our presenter, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation. There are also handouts and exercises available to accompany this presentation, which you can download through the webinar tool panel. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now here's Clark. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Okay, thanks very much. Can everyone see my screen? Um, I, thanks for that introduction. I'd also like to thank the ELECTS committee. Uh, they've been a fantastic group of people to work with and I'm really excited to bring this to you today. Um, I'd also like to thank you uh, for signing up for this webinar. I think it's really easy for us to say, you know, I've got my processes, I've got my tools. Uh, it's pretty much working for me. Um, and especially when it comes to what seems to be an intimidating uh, software like R, it'd be easy to say, uh, no, I'm going to pass on this. Um, but uh, so I really want to hand it to you uh, for joining this webinar and for opening yourself up to uh, this new technology. And I'm really excited to bring it to you. A little bit about myself. Um, I got my BA in history in 2006, uh, my library degree in 2011, and I'm finishing up my uh, master's in history. So something might stick out to you, and that is I uh, have a humanities background. Um, I didn't do particularly well in math or science. Um, the only programming class I've ever taken was in high school. Um, I really don't bring any of that hard quantitative uh, expertise to R. Um, I'm much more comfortable with a text than I am with analytics. But um, I started learning R about five years ago, um, and I really became interested in it. I, re I really took a liking to it. Um, I took some online free courses, I read some books about it, and I began integrating it into my work. So um, whenever I had a data problem, I would go to R instead of Excel. And at first that was a lot of work, but over time I really got used to R. And actually, um, there's a lot of creativity that goes into our programming. We all have unique data and we all have unique questions of our data. And so that's where I think that some of you who don't come from a computer programming or a math or science background can really find a lot of interest in, and creativity in using R. And I will say that I'm living proof you don't have to be a statistician or programmer to learn and use R. It's very rewarding too. So this is the first of three sessions. Uh, this first session, we're gonna be introducing R and R Studio and going over some basic functions. Uh, the next session, we're going to actually start reading in some data and performing some operations on that data, exploring it. And then we'll bring everything together in the third session where we'll be doing some more fun uh, data analysis and visualization. So we're going to have a poll now on uh, what programs you currently use for your data cleanup analysis and visualization. And uh, this is going to be a uh, multiple choice poll. So you can um, select as many options as is relevant to you. Um, 
I'm sure a lot of us use Excel. Uh, Tableau I've seen used more and more often in libraries. It's a really dynamic tool for um, visualizing data. A lot of times people will also say, you know, why do I need to learn R? Why do I need to learn a data analysis when I've got that built into my uh, usage analysis tool? And I would say to that that um, really uh, there are some things that the usage analysis tool does not analyze. You might have some questions that aren't um, that you just cannot ask using those tools. And also, it's kind of a truism that 80% uh, of your time in a data analysis project is taken up with um, preparing the data. And so if you have messy data, a lot of times those usage analysis tools uh, can't fix it. So we see 100% of people uh, use Excel, that's no surprise. And uh, I'm not here to bash Excel. I still use Excel all the time. A lot of our users do like to bash Excel. Uh, I'm not one of those people. It still has its uses. And I think that all of these have a kind of uh, role to play in our um, data analysis. So thanks for filling that out. Okay. All right, this is going to be overwhelming. Here's your warning up front. I've really tried to balance uh, making this fun, engaging, and interactive with just listing, here's a function, here's what it does, here's another function, here's what it does. And uh, I have to say, at times, I opted for the latter, and that's because I really want to make this useful for you, um, something that you can go back to. To kind of ease the pressure, I created a couple of handouts, and you can download those in your GoToWebinar window by uh, clicking on the PDF icons under Handouts. And so the, this expands on a lot of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about, and it also has some uh, exercises built in so that you can get your hands dirty and really start playing around with R. Honestly, you're not going to learn it just by watching these webinars. Uh, you really have to uh, begin using it. And that's what the handouts are designed to do. Also in the first handout, the one that's called session 1A, there are some R resources that are at the back and um, those can also help you as you continue to integrate R into your work. All right, so um, the outline for this session, we're gonna talk about what R is in uh, Studio. We're gonna go over some basics of R and we're gonna end by troubleshooting errors. R is more of a programming language than it is a statistics program. Uh, its originators, Robert Gentleman and Ross Ihaka, uh, described it as a language for data analysis and graphics. And it can do so much. Uh, you, can, you can create data in R, you can import it, you can scrape it off the web, clean it, reshape it, visualize it, do modeling, text mining it, and so much more. So why R, and especially why R as compared with Excel? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, for one, R is much more powerful at data manipulation. Like, we in libraries, we're swimming with data. We have so much data and there's so much potential meaning to it. And sometimes it's really hard to get at that meeting, meaning. So R can help you if you need to create really complicated subsets or merges. Um, and uh, it's much more robust and powerful than Excel in preparing data for analysis. Um, also, it's easier to automate. So um, it uses a scripting language rather than a point and click graphical user interface like Excel. And what that means is if you need to perform a number of operations over and over again on the same type of data, you have that all saved in a script and it's all documented there. Also, it's much faster. Uh, sometimes even doing find and replace in Excel, if it's a big enough data set, can take a long time, whereas R can do it in a fraction of a second. Uh, it reads any kind of data, and that ranges from text files to Excel files to SPSS files and other stats files. Um, basically, uh, any data type, someone has built a package to allow it to be read into R. I find R is helpful to keep my projects organized, so I'll have my file for my data, my raw data, my results, my files for my code, and my files for my plots and documentation, and um, you can tie all of those together in your R scripts. Um, R also works with larger da um, data sets than Excel, and um, the, uh, like I said earlier, um, you're able to really crunch bigger data. 
Also, R reinforces reproducibility and sharing. So because you can uh, create scripts, that's even helpful for yourself. So you'll go back you know, a year later and you'll be able to see, oh, this is exactly what I did. Whereas with Excel, you, know, you do something and it's kind of lost to oblivion. With R, it's documented step by step. And that also reinforces finding and fixing errors, both errors in the data itself, as well as errors with your uh, data analysis. R is free and open source. Uh, it allows for really advanced statistics if, um, if you know how to do those. Uh, it produces some beautiful visualizations, which we'll see in session three. Uh, it runs on many platforms, Windows, Apple, Unix, Linux, has a very active user community. And really it serves as kind of a one-stop shop for uh, all of these different functions. Um, and we'll talk about those as we go along. To download R, you go to r-project.org. You click on CRAN, you go to your country, and then you select the download link on the city that is closest to you. And this detail, <clears throat> excuse me, this detail is in your handout. Okay, what does it mean that R is free and open source? Well, it's licensed under the terms of a GNU general public license. And what that means is that unlike a program like Excel or Photoshop, anyone can access the source code. That means that they can build on it, improve on it, and create packages for it. So R was created in 1995, which is over 20 years ago, but because anyone can build packages for it, um, it continues to be used, and actually its user base continues to grow. And we're gonna be talking about packages in section, uh, session two. It has a huge user base in a variety of different fields. So most academic disciplines use it, um, different companies and journalism. And uh, what all of this means, the huge user base and the openness means that getting help is fairly easy. Chances are, if you're running into a problem, someone else has had that problem. Most likely many people have had that problem and they've asked that question to typically Stack Overflow. So whenever I'm working in R, I'll have another browser window open that has about 50 tabs in it for me asking any question. And usually I'll just type the question into Google the first answer will generally be in uh, Stack Overflow. And I'll just copy and paste code from there and put it into my uh, script and I'll modify the variables and make it work for me. And I think that a lot of computer programmers do that and um, just using code that other people have, have uh, suggested. And R is uh, the user community I think you'll find is really uh, helpful and forthcoming with assistance. Some of the drawbacks, well, in R, you don't actually modify the data file. You read the file into R and uh, as an object, and you modify that object. So what that means is for really, really big data, that object, uh, it's stored in the physical memory of the computer. So if the data is bigger than your physical memory, that means you can't use R on it. So I've worked with some pretty big data, though, so this really isn't a limitation you'll run into very often. Um, second is there's no graphical user interface. And for some people, um, what I mean by that is you can't point and click. And for some people, um, the command line is intimidating. They don't want to have to type out functions. And, and um, I'll say that I was one of those people too when I first started. I mean, you have to actually physically type out characters in order to make something happen. Why can't I just click and something happens? So I think that as you push through it, uh, you'll eventually get used to it. But I understand that there will be some people who just don't get there, which is fine. Um, and there's actually a graphical user interface software for R that's called R Commander. And that's also free and open source. And you can download it from rcommander.com. So if you're one of those peop people who is not going to want to code on the command line, this, se these, this series of sessions is going to focus on that because that's really where the power of R is. However, um, for a lot of major functions, you can use R Commander. All right, this is kind of a, a test that we're all gonna have to go through. Um, so you're gonna, anytime you learn a new tool, you're gonna have to weigh out the time it's gonna take to learn the tool, which for R, if you're striving to do a lot of robust data analysis, is going to take some time with the expected advantages of adopting it. I would say that for those of us who work with data regularly, which I think for a lot of librarians is just about all of us, whether or not we, we choose to, we have a lot of data at our fingertips. I would say the advantages really do outweigh the time 
but this is a, an exercise that you're going to have to go through yourself. To kind of push you over the edge, I'll give you a few examples of the ways that we've used R um, to show you how much power it can have. Um, one of the tasks is cleaning and merging messy data that comes out of the ILS. So I don't know about y'all, but we have a lot of messy data that comes from our ILS, and a lot of that is not due to us. It's due to the way that it's exported from the ILS. And one example of this is multiple repeated fields. So this example, uh, order dates are based on the bibliographic record and not the item record, which means the data looks like this, all staggered and pretty much useless. And this is one of the most irritating things about this data. And sometimes those rows can go on for 15 or 20 um, instances if there were that many copies purchased. So you can write scripts in R that uh, clean that up. Um, the second thing, uh, so I'm trying to get, okay, here it is. You, so you can write a script in R that uh, makes it long so that each entry has a date that corresponds to it. Uh, second, we're all used to uh, 0 to 0. Uh, something's wrong with my animations here. Uh, our 0 to 0 fields that have uh, lots of unnecessary details. So you can write scripts in R that extract just the ISBNs. Uh, detecting data errors. So this is a list of uh, publication years, but I doubt that the book was published in 1068. And also, unless this is a, a Murakami novel, I don't think that 19K4 is a publication year either. So you can you know, write a script that says, exclude all dates between these years and find any dates that have numbers in them. The data that we get from vendors can also be messy. One thing that we do, especially when we want to merge data together, like say we want to see how many print books we have and uh, how many ebooks we have, or um, merge databases together, is uh, you have to merge by the name field. And names are not normalized. There might be an ampersand, there might be lowercase, uppercase. So you can use R to clean up names. You can also use R to remove and add hyphens, say into ISSNs or ISBNs. Uh, create custom subsets. So let's say you want only eBooks that are DDA triggered in the field of geography that have over 15 user sessions. You can use R to create very custom dynamic subsets. Merging data, both um, uh, merging data between vendors or even within daters, uh, vendors. For uh, example, I've noticed that holdings data often will include bibliographic information like uh, call number or subject, whereas usage data does not include that bibliographic information. It only has like the link or the, uh, the collection as well as the usage statistics. So you might need to merge those together so you can actually figure out what uh, journals say in a particular subject area are getting used. Uh, I find R much easier than access to do merging. Another thing you might use R for is to recode variables. This is a subset of data from our K through 12 curriculum library. So we wrote a script that says, you know, anytime you detect in the subject field the terms arithmetic, geography, you know, algebra, create a new field that says mathematics. And we ran through and did that for all of our subjects. And that allowed us to analyze our collection by core subject area. And um, we pulled in some uh, year of publication data too. And at a glance now we're able to see mathematics is very strong uh, in the late 90s, um, but it doesn't have too many in the 2010s and so on. And we use this uh, to make some purchasing decisions. Finally, you can also use R to manipulate dates and times. Uh, here we took the, pub, uh, the last time a book was checked out for all of the books in the youth library. So we took the entire youth library, we, we pulled out only the last date, of the last time that the item was checked out under the assumption that when the person checked it out, they were here in the library. So on the left, you can see that's too sloppy to tell anything. So we rounded it up to the nearest 15 minute interval. And we were able to see that uh, we have three hour classes here at UHCL. Before each three hour class period begins, so before 10 a.m., before 1 p.m., before 4 p.m., and before 7 p.m., people, there's a spike in usage. So you can use that to make staffing decisions as well. You can create all kinds of cool visualizations from word clouds to bar plots to line plots, and you can actually even do GIS in R as well. <clears throat> 
In some uh, collection analysis, doing data reference, we have more and more faculty and students who are asking not only where can I find this data, but how can I clean it up and get it in a usable state. Um, doing analysis on your website or IR, uh, library usage, and even writing documents. So that's like kind of closing the loop and saying you've done all this analysis, now you need to communicate your findings to either internal or external stakeholders. And our, comes, our studio comes with a platform that's called Markdown, and that allows you to integrate your visualizations into a document. And actually, aesthetically, I find it much more pleasing than uh, Word. Um, it's also easier to work to integrate your visualizations there. Okay, so that's my case for using R in libraries. Uh, we're going to move on now to talk about the R Studio environment. This is a user interface for working with R. It's called an Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. Uh, you can use R without using R Studio, but it's much more limiting. And that's because R Studio acts as something of a graphical user interface for R. So it makes it easier to do a lot of things like import data, write and save scripts, install packages, and work with objects. R Studio is also free and open source, and you can download it from rstudio.com. There's four major panes in RStudio, and we're gonna go through each one of these, starting with the bottom left, the console pane. Um, there's kind of three ways of working, doing data analysis. One is uh, point and click, graphical user interface like Excel. The second is uh, in the console pane, and the third is in scripting pane. So R is a hybrid environment that pulls together all three of these. The console pane is like a command line. So in that, you type a command, you press enter, something happens, you type a command, you press enter, something else happens. Um, and so here you can see I've assigned Y to, uh, assigned the number five to Y, and then added the number five to Y. So um, the command prompt is in the bottom left-hand corner, and you can type commands directly into it. Right above that is what's called the script pane, and this is the third type of data analysis. This is, instead of writing commands line by line, you write a block of commands, and you execute all of that as a script. Um, and so here you can see I have some comments, which uh, start with a hashtag, and um, those can be like notes to yourself or notes to future users. So you use the script pane as a kind of way of drafting, running, and saving your scripts. Continuing on into the upper right corner is the environment pane. As I mentioned earlier, when you read data into R, you're creating an object out of that. And so in the upper right corner, the environment pane shows all of the objects that are currently in your R environment, in your R session. Right next to that is the history pane. And uh, this will show you all of the commands that you've executed in the console. So this can be helpful if you've done something and you need to go back and check what it was. Another little tip is uh, you can click on in the console and you can press the up and down keys on your keyboard to scroll through commands that you've entered in previously. Finally, in the bottom right corner, uh, this does a lot of different things. This is the navigation pane. Uh, and you can use this to navigate to your files, to view plots, to load packages, and very importantly, to see help files, which we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, you can play around with your pane uh, size and appearance. Uh, for myself, I like to code with a black background and white text. And you can do that by going to Tools Options. All right, so let's kind of get started here. Um, the command prompt sits right underneath the script pane, as we talked about earlier. And basically, there's a blinking cursor there prompting you to take some kind of action. Uh, we type an expression into the prompt, and then we press the Enter key to evaluate the expression. So here, you can also use R as a calculator. So here, I've typed in the expression 2 plus 2. I press Enter. That expression is evaluated, and the evaluation puts an, has an output. And in this case, that output is to print the, um, the result of the evaluation to the console. So it prints the number four to the console. The first operator you're going to come across in R is called the assignment operator. And this is meant to look like an arrow pointing left. 
Now this is the less than sign, which is shifting comma and the hyphen with no space in between. So like we saw a little while ago, you can assign values to a uh, symbol. In this case, I'm assigning the number five to the symbol Y using that assignment operator. And uh, you don't have to have a space in between each one, but I typically do, it's best practice. So here we say Y gets five. Okay, again, you type in Y gets five and you press enter into the console, that will evaluate the expression. Nothing is going to happen in the console when you assign a value to a symbol except in the upper right hand corner, you'll now see in your environment that you have a uh, Y as an object there. It's a numeric vector with one element. Or you could say that Y is a numeric vector and the first element is the number five. And we'll talk about what vector means here in a moment. Now when I type Y into the console and I press enter, it's going to print out what Y is. And the one there just means that the number five is the first element of this vector. You can assign pretty much anything to any variable and then perform operations on or with that variable. There are some restrictions in what you can call your uh, symbols and those are listed in the handout that comes with this series of webinars. So for example, I say Y gets five, I can say Y plus 20, I can say y squared, or I could create another variable z and assign to that a three element vector, and that's using the uh, c function. Then I can add y and z together, and r does something very unique and very important, and that's called, it vectorizes operations. So in this case, it's adding y to z, adding five to each element of z. Another thing you can do with your values is you can call functions on them. Uh, function, sum is a function in R. So here I put sum of Y and Z. And in this case, the sum tells, uh, tells R to add together all of the elements of Y and all of the elements of Z to get 35. So yes, sum is a function and R contains a number of function that ends a number of functions and this is what you use to do something with your data. You call a function on a variable by entering the function into the console or into the script pane, followed by a parentheses and the variables. So in this case, I put sum of three and four and it prints out the sum seven. Functions can also be nested, and this is very important because you can do a lot of things using only one line of code. And there's pretty much no limit to the amount of, um, of things that you can nest in it, and R will evaluate it uh, accordingly. For instance, SQRT, that's a function that will take the square root. So here I take the square root of nine, and, uh, which is three, and add it to four using the sum function. I'm sorry if I'm giving you all flashbacks to uh, algebra class. Uh, there's also a function in R called is period function. So I can type into the console is function sum and R will tell me true. Yes, sum is a function. Okay, this is one of the most important uh, slides and this is getting help. Uh, pretty much anytime you use a function, you want to read the help page for it and you can get help by putting a question mark followed by the name of the function, or you can call help, meaning use the help function and put the function name in parentheses. So let's break down what you would see on a help page. First of all, it tells you what the function does. So in this case, sum returns the sum of all of the values present in its arguments. A, fun a function takes a specified number of arguments. In this case, sum takes two. The first argument is ellipses. Um, the ellipses means unlimited number of values. And we look down here under the arguments and we'll see that the ellipses indicates an unlimited number of numeric, complex, or logical vectors. I'm just gonna focus on the numeric aspect of that right now. So in other words, I can type in sum and I can type in as many values as I want, as long as they're numeric, and it's gonna print the answer. It's gonna evaluate those. The second argument that sum takes is na.rm. And so we look down in the arguments uh, 
section and we see that na.rm is logical, which means that it's true false. And it's asking, should I remove missing values? Here's what that means. If I sum together three, four, and na, na is the way that r refers to missing values, then uh, it's gonna print out na because you can't add three and four to na. So you have to specify in your function call, three, four, na, those are one argument, and the na.rm, you have to set that to true. So that means you're telling R, yes, missing values should be removed, and then you'll get seven. It's very important to read the help pages carefully, look at what all of the arguments are, and uh, what they do, and the way that, the form that they take. And then you just include them after commas in the function call. So sometimes you'll have a function that has 15 or, you know, 10 or 15 different arguments, and this gives you a lot more power over what you're doing with your data. I'm gonna go over a, a few different functions now, two different functions, and then we're gonna go over the different data types in R. So the first function is stir. Uh, stir is a way of compactly displaying information about an object. So here I create a, oops, I create a vector called dog breeds, and I assign to it a, a com combination of Beagle, Pug, and Chihuahua. When I call stir on dog breeds, it's gonna print to the console what it is. It's a character vector, it's three elements, and then it's gonna tell me what those three elements are. The second important function is C. This is how you combine values into a vector. So I can create a vector X and combine one, two, three, four, and five. Then when I call stir on X, it will tell me this is a numeric vector. It has five elements and here's what they are. So stir and C, very important. I've been throwing around this term vector a lot. So what does that mean? As I've said a couple of times, whenever you create, uh, whenever you pull something into R, you're creating an object out of it and you're manipulating that object. Uh, so vectors are the most basic type of object. Think about an Excel spreadsheet, okay? So you have column A, let's say this is titles, and you have column B, this is the last date checked out, and you have column C, which is, let's say, total number of checkouts. In column A, everything is the same exact type. It's all titles, it's all characters. Even if one of the titles is 1984, that's still a character because you're not gonna be doing any mathematical operations on it. So everything in column A is a character, everything in column B is a date, everything in column C is a number, which you can do mathematical operations with, like you can find the highest number of checkouts. So you can think of columns A, B, and C each as vectors, a sequence of elements of the same class. We're gonna go over the main types of vectors in R. So uh, first is numeric or integer. Uh, there are two um, R treats each of these differently. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into what the difference is right now. So I can create a, a numeric vector, or this is actually an integer vector, my underscore integers, and assign to it the numbers one through 10. That's what the column is there. And then again, when I call stir on my integers, it tells me integer 10, uh, 10 length. There's another function that's called class, and you can use this to ask R, what class is this vector? So I put in class and it returns integer. Another type of vector is character, um, and this is, as you would expect, uh, characters. So here I create a vector, my underscore characters with three names, and you can see, I uh, use uh, quotation marks, that will create, a that will tell R these are character vectors. And when I call stir on that again, I get a character and uh, the class of that is character. Uh, next type is logical and this is very important for um, subsetting data. So logical is just true, false. Uh, so I can create one called my logical that's true, false, false, true. Uh, you can also use T and F. Another way of asking R what type of class your vector is, is calling is period logical. So you can say, here I say is logical, my logical, and it will say true. You can also say is character, you know, is integer, is numeric, and R will tell you the result. I'm not gonna spend much time on factors here. I don't use them very often. Um, 
and I usually coerce my factors to characters, and I'll tell you what that means next time. Okay, subsetting a vector. Uh, so oftentimes we'll need to take a subset of our vector. We don't want to work with the entire vector, we only want to work with a portion of it. That's what subsetting means. So let's say we create a vector of five elements, we call it scale, we use the C to combine these five elements, and it's do, re, mi, fa, so. The way to subset a vector is to use uh, brackets. So here I say scale brackets one, and what that's going to do is return the first element of that vector. So if I say scale five, that's gonna return the fifth element of the vector. You can also use C to subset. So you can say, I wanna subset scale and only get the first and the fifth element. You have to use C though. If you just put one comma five in there, it's gonna throw an error. So you're saying I'm subsetting scale with a combination of one and five, and then you'll get do and so. All right, and stick with me here. You can also use logical vectors to subset it. So I can say, uh, combine true, false, 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 true, and what do you think that's gonna do? It's gonna take the first and the fifth element. So it's gonna set the second, third, and the fourth element to false and only return the first and the fifth. A vector can only contain objects of the same class. In other words, all character vectors have to be character. Except for lists, this is a very special type. I'm not gonna spend much time on it here. Um, it's really more for advanced users, but you can create a list that has objects of multiple different types. So here I have integers, I have characters, and I have a logical all within the same list. If you mix different types of uh, objects into one vector, then R is going to coerce the vector to be a single class. What do I mean by that? So let's say I create Y and I assign to Y the numbers one through 10 and the character A. Then when I call stir on Y, it's going to tell me that's a character vector uh, with 11 elements. And you can see with the quotation marks, it's uh, made those um, into characters. It's coerced those into characters. And if you look up in the environment pane on the upper right hand corner, it will tell you what your data types are. Um, and that's important because if you add together those uh, elements with uh, quotation marks, those characters, you're gonna get an error because it cannot add character uh, elements, only numeric. All right, uh, stick with me here. This is uh, NA, this is the way to deal with missing values. Uh, next time we're gonna talk about how to read in data with NA values, but for now we're just gonna talk about how to deal with them in vectors. So you can use is period NA, is dot NA is a function that will test if a value is NA or not. So let's say I create a vector and just call it vec and assign to it the combination of value one, value two, and NA. Now if I call is NA on vec, it's gonna print out logical response. It's going to evaluate each element and it's going to tell me, is this NA true or false? So in this case, obviously, it's false, false, and true. Now, if you remember back to the scale, uh, when I use that uh, logical vector to subset it, you can do the same thing here. So if I only wanted to get my NA values, I could subset vector using is period NA. So in that case, it's gonna leave out the first and the second, and it's only gonna return the third. It might make more sense to look at it in the converse case. So this is using uh, complete cases. This is another function that will, but this will test if the value is not missing. So in this case, if I subset vec using complete cases, it's going to return the true, true, false, and that means it's gonna subset out, it's gonna leave out that third value. And this is very important because oftentimes we want to leave out those missing values and we only wanna do analysis on complete cases. This slide uh, is mostly gonna come into play next session when we do reading data into R. There are a number of different ways of getting data into R. And 
what results is a data frame. So what, whether I'm pulling in a CSV file or an Excel file or parsing an HTML table, I'm generally going to be creating what R calls a data frame. And anyone familiar with Excel should be able to understand data frames. It's a grid of rows and columns. Each column, as we discussed earlier, is the, is the same type. Each column is a single data type, excuse me. And it's the same length, which means that you don't have one column that's longer than another. Otherwise, there's something wrong with your data. So basically, it's a square. Not same number of rows, same number of columns. So you can actually create a data frame within uh, R and uh, using the data.frame function. So here I create a data frame with three elements, title, author, and checkouts. And I assign to each of them a combination of values. And I always set strings as factors as false. This is a point I'll be hammering home next session. And when you do that, uh, it appears up in your environment. So you see there you have uh, ebooks as a data frame, three observations of three variables. And if you click that little blue arrow, it will show you what all of the uh, observ what all of the uh, variables are. You can print small data frames to the console. So the first thing you want to do when you get data into R is look at it. So you can, uh, putting print is the same thing as just typing the value in, same exact thing. So if I say print ebooks, it will print that to a console so I can take a look at it. However, uh, for larger data frames, that's just going to eat up your entire console and it's not going to make any sense. So in that case, it's better to call the view function. And this is one of the few functions in R that use uh, capital letters. So it's a capital V and then IEW. So you'd use view ebooks and this will open up the data frame in your viewer window in the uh, upper left hand corner. And that's the first thing you want to do. You want to be able to scan through and see uh, what your data looks like. Make sure that it has no mistakes. You can also click on the object in the environment pane and that will open it up in the viewer window. Now, I remember when I first started using R, I wanted to be able to copy and paste cells and click in a cell and edit it and use it the same way that I used Excel. So can you edit data by hand like with spreadsheets? You can do that, yes, but I would say it's generally best practice to script and document all modifications. So if there's a cell that you need to edit, it might be better if you just went ahead and wrote a script to do that so that it's documented. If it's just your own private internal use, maybe it doesn't matter, that's going to be up to you. But the way to edit data by hand is if you put in edit and then put the data frame name, that will open up a data editor window and then you can click in a cell and use it the same way as you would Excel. All right, I'm going to talk about a few quick functions uh, for working in our studio uh, and then talk about troubleshooting data errors and then we will open it up to questions. So uh, you can clear all objects from your R Studio workspace by clicking on the broom in the environment history pane in the upper right. Uh, your, your workspace can quickly become very cluttered, so sometimes it's good to just clear everything out of it. But if you need to clear out specific objects, you can use the RM function and just put the, um, the name of the object in there. Um, if you want to clear your console, which is again the bottom left-hand window, you can press Control L, or you can go to Edit Clear Console in R Studio, and that'll leave you with a nice clean window. I mentioned this earlier that while you're in the console, if you press the up and down arrow keys on your keyboard, it will cycle through previously entered commands. And finally, if you're writing a script in the script pane, basically when you write, when you execute that, it will execute in the console. So you can highlight your entire script and then you can click on the run button, which is in the upper right corner there, or you can press control R and it will execute the entire script. All right, finally, and troubleshooting errors. Um, and errors, just get used to them. All of us who use R 
uh, have had many, many more error messages than we have had successful functions. So here's just a few of the more common ones. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but R is case sensitive. So if I created an object and with the lowercase y, and I tried to do an operation with an uppercase y, it's gonna tell me object not found. So object not found means you've tried to run analysis on an object that has not been loaded into the environment. So R can't find whatever you're looking for. You need to check for typos, spelling, capitalization, and then you need to actually make sure that the object has actually been loaded into R. Second, could not, could not find function. So here I tried to take the average of, again, we have that C there, very important, the C combination of zero, five, and 10, and it told me could not find function average. I mean, that's because R uses mean to take the average. So could not find function means you try to use a function that doesn't exist. Check again for typos, capitalization, um, and also next time we'll be working with uh, packages and with packages, you have to load the package into your R session before you use those functions. So it's possible that you have not loaded the uh, library into your session. Hanging plus sign with a blinking cursor. This means that R is waiting for something. Um, in this case, I didn't close my parentheses. So since that comes at the very end, I could just close the parentheses. Uh, so a lot of times this hanging plus means that you, have a close, you haven't closed your quotes or there's something nested that you haven't closed and you just can't go back and modify it, which means that you have to press the escape key, interrupt the command, and then go back and add the required symbols. Finally, unexpected something in your function, in this case an unexpected semicolon. Uh, that means you've entered a symbol in the wrong place. And the good thing is R stops evaluating the expression when it runs into the unexpected symbol. All right, I know that was an onslaught of new information, and at this point it probably seems disconnected. I don't know if there's a way of introducing R without going into the nuts and bolts like that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, work through some of the exercises on those handouts. Uh, there's a great interactive tutorial that's called Swirl. It's a package that you install in RStudio. Um, look on session 1A handout under the resources and it's resource number one. And that will take you through a lot of what I talked about today, except it will be much more interactive. Um, I hope that all of the technical language didn't kind of make you zone out. Um, it's, it's, it is really important to wrap your head around these concepts before we get started with the fun stuff, which it's coming, I promise, we'll do much more fun and interesting things than just listing out a bunch of functions next time and in session three. Uh, so next time, we're, we have a couple of weeks of a break, so this gives you time to complete that swirl tutorial and look around at some of the other exercises and do the exercises on the handouts. If you have any questions about installing R, installing R Studio, or anything on the handouts or anything at all, please feel free to reach out to me via email. I hope you all will sign up for session number two. And uh, with that, we will turn it over to any questions. Hey, thanks so much, Clark. That was really interesting. Yeah, you can um, go ahead and switch over to questions. Could you help me out there? I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. um, so I think I see one that came in earlier when you were talking about the uh, sum of y and z. There was maybe a math, there's a math question there. It's asking, should uh, be 5 plus 10 plus 15 plus 20 equals 50? And I think it was 35 on the slide. If, I don't know if maybe you could just scroll back to that one really Let's quick. See. Like I told you, math isn't my first subject. That's why I rely on uh, R to do it right for me. So what it did is it took 5 plus 5 Five, okay, so y was 5, so it took 5, plus z was 5, 10, and 15. So it took 5 plus 5 plus 10 plus 15 to get 35. Does that make sense? So 5 plus 10 plus 15 is 30, and then plus 5 is 35. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> okay. 
Definitely. Okay. So there's also a question um, saying it would be more helpful to know a little bit more about what your use cases are, such as how, when, and why you use this in your work life. Oh, that's great. I, and I, I tried to do that with the with the beginning, and um, I'm happy to expand on it. Uh, like, but I really think like we get data in so many different ways. We get it from vendors. We get it from our, our bibliographic data from our ILS. We have data about our users. So if you're in public libraries, there's demographic data, maybe about you know what languages people in the community speak or uh, socioeconomic uh, status. Um, or you know how far they have to commute, or you know you could get even more into it and say like bring in food desert data, or and if you're in an academic environment, you have course enrollment, you have um, you know what majors people are in, you have a lot of different academic success measures, um, and you might have library space usage statistics. And I really think that uh, it's incumbent on all of us to wrap our heads around the data. And to me. Um, I don't think that that is possible just restricting ourselves to Excel. It's just not powerful enough. And so it's kind of, we're obligated, which I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of you uh, feel the same way, and that's why you're here, to step up our game and add another tool into our toolkit so that we can really make sense of um, the library's value to our different communities. Thanks. Um, someone also has a question about why you prefer R over Python. Uh, you know, honestly, it's just because that's what I uh, started before. And I've tried to learn Python, and um, a lot of times I'll get into it and I'll say, uh, I'm more comfortable in R. <laughs> so I'll just go back to R. But uh, there are some really cool uh, R versus Python um, kind of contests out there. Uh, there's a really good one on uh, death scenes in movies. And these two data scientists did a R versus Python showdown. And I think it really shows that both are extremely powerful, uh, robust tools. So I don't, for me, I guess I don't, haven't used Python enough to say R is better. I just, R is what I've stuck with. Mm -hmm. Um, someone has a question about uh, the first handout where you mentioned that Swirl is a package you can install in R, and they're wondering if that is in RStudio. Yeah, honestly, uh, after you download R and RStudio, I never even open R. I only ever work in RStudio. So, uh, like, uh, as I mentioned, RStudio sits on top of R, and it helps you just use the language better. You do have to have R installed to use RStudio, but it's the num I could probably count on two hands the number of times I've even opened just R. So you'll go into R Studio and you will just type in, as the instructions say there, install period packages swirl and just hit enter, uh, put that in your console, and it will take you through the process of installing the swirl tutorial. And then you type in library swirl and it will launch there in your R Studio session. It's a great tutorial. I highly recommend it. Thanks. Um, someone else asked uh, what your first use of R was in a library environment. Oh, great question. I set myself a huge bar for that. Um, I had a huge list of journals that uh, faculty had published in, and I wanted to merge it with um, like bibliographic data on those journals. And uh, I remember it took me, I probably spent 20, 30 hours just crunching that. I'm not saying that to intimidate you, to intimidate you. it was a lot of fun. Um, but I, I think that as you use R, things will just pop out to you and you'll, you'll start to say to yourself, ah, I could solve this problem in R. Um, and uh, kind of problems just arise, you know, they show themselves and you say, ah, there's a way that I can solve this using R. Uh, do you have a favorite place to find easy or simple data to use for practice? That is a great question. Um, in the uh, handout that I gave, um, there's, if you go under our resources, section 3.2 uh, has some data that you can just play with. Uh, that's already preloaded into R. So if you just type data with open open parentheses, close parentheses, nothing in there, it will give you a list of data sets. And then you can load those data sets by typing in data, parentheses, 
and then the name of the data set. So the one that I have in that handout is called MT Cars, and that one's a really a lot of fun to practice with because it has a lot of um, different variables like you know the number of cylinders in the engine, the number of miles per gallon, um, and there's also a, a link right below that that says. Um, see also rdatamining.com's list of free data sets. So if you click on that hyperlink, that'll give you a ton of free data that you can use to practice. And if you stay tuned for sessions two and three, I'm gonna be giving you some data from our ILS and some ebook data. And that's what we're gonna use together as we practice. So we're gonna have some real life library examples. Awesome. Someone else just sent in a comment that the New York City government also has some data that you can play with and that's at opendata.cityofnewyork.us. Oh, thanks very much. Yep. Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more question, but if there are still more, we will um, send those out afterwards as well um, with yep. the email, the slides. But um, this last question is, what data formats does R accept? Just about anything that you can think of. Um, and we'll be expanding on this more in session two, but um, it will take text files, CSV files, Excel files, SPSS, JSON, GIS file, uh, shape files, um, SQL files, XML, it can parse HTML. Um, basically, if the data type exists, someone has written a package that will help you load it into R. Okay, great. Thank you, Clark. Thank you. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, please, you can feel free to email me directly. Um, I hope that you learned a lot and I'm really excited to see you at the end of the month for session two, data exploration. Okay, thank you again to our presenter, Clark. Uh, thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Aaron Elzey, Mary Reeder, and Ai-Ping chen -Gaffey, and to Jazz Lee Coley from the ELECT's office. They support, the support they provide makes it possible for us to present these webinars. ELECT's has other continuing education events coming up. Part two of this webinar series will take place on May 23rd. Um, you can visit the ELECT's website to register or to find more information on any of these. ELECTS also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will begin on May 22nd, discussing challenges of cataloging special collections material. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our session.